My name is Mario Paredes. I am the director of Catholic uh, Ministry for the American Bible Society. I am delighted to host uh, this evening at our headquarters. Uh, it is indeed a joy and a privilege to welcome each one of you uh, on behalf of our leadership here at the Bible House. I was just sharing uh, with the bishop that our Board of Trustees um, is formed by 24 members. Seven of them are Roman Catholics. And this is an interfaith uh, organization. Uh, but the Catholic presence is very strong. And in the last five years, uh, we have established and created uh, this Catholic ministry. Uh, and essentially, our mission truly is to engage people with the Bible. Uh, no other reason for our existence. Uh, um, we realize that the lack of Bible literacy is growing and growing in a fast pace and uh, we need to design program to engage people. So uh, it is a joy and an honor to welcome the Common uh, Ground Initiative and to each one of you. Uh, this is a a day, unfortunately, you know that did not have much uh, for the audience, but certainly uh, you could enjoy a wonderful program that the organizer had put together. Uh, thank you again and feel at home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bishop Michael Warfell from the Diocese of Great Falls Billings, Montana. It's a, it's a small little diocese to the west of New York. Which, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little, it, like I said, small. It's just a little shorter than 95,000 square miles. So, And we probably have more cows than we do people. So, um, But thanks for coming to this 15th Monsignor Philip J. Meridian Lecture is very much of an integral part of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative. And uh, there have been a host of very insightful um, uh, speakers over the, the 15 uh, lectures that have been held. And we ha have the promise and the conviction that tonight will be another special one, Sister Katerina. She's a very great lady. And she's smart, too. So. <laughs> um, uh, as we uh, continue uh, this, this celebration, we're going to begin with a prayer. I would just uh, ask you, as we do our prayer uh, tonight, remember Bishop Joe Sullivan, who died today, you know. So just remember him in our prayer as a uh, religious prayer, and uh, he was very in an integral part of the Catholic Common Room Initiative, and it's just quite appropriate that we remember him. So that I would invite uh, Sheila McLaughlin, who's going to lead us. She's uh, Director of the Bernardine Center for Theology and Ministry at the Chicago Theological Union, which is in Chicago. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know that. So, uh, uh, Sheila, would you? Before we pray, I just would like to add my welcome to the Bishop Warfell. It's wonderful to be here with you. We seem to be um, continuing a tradition of having pouring down rain every time we have the Bernie lecture. So I don't know what that means. If you're Irish, that's a good thing. So <laughs> we'll just go with that. So uh, it, common ground is impossible without prayer, without uh, working in the spirit of prayer at all times. So. <laughs> It's fitting that we begin with prayer. So I invite you to stand for our opening song. <laughs>
this evening, we offer our thanks and praise for your never-ending goodness to us. We thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name as people dedicated to serving your church and your world. We thank you for calling us to ministries of your making and for the vision and witness of our mentors and friends, especially Cardinal Joseph Bernadine and Monsignor Philip Murian, whom we honor tonight. We know it is your work that we do, and so we humbly ask that you send your creative and energizing spirit to guide and sustain us in all we do. And tonight we pray especially for the vital work of the Common Ground Initiative and all who work tirelessly to achieve that common ground. May we be attentive in our listening and wise in our speaking so as to understand more fully our mission and build a more respectful and loving church community. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love, striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, as you were also called to the one hope of your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And Christ gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers, who equip the Holy Ones for the work of ministry, for, for building up the body of Christ, and we, until we all attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the extent of the full stature of Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us offer our prayers for this night.
be with all who suffer and are unable to change their situations, that your grace and the love of others may ease their pain. We pray. is professor of pastoral theology at Seton Hall University. Professor Fox has committed herself to the development and support of lay ministers in the church and with the vision the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. While she has explored the many ways that lay persons live out their baptismal call in the church and in the world, a particular focus of her has been the lay, lay ecclesial ministry and she's done a wonderful job in fostering a spirit and in places like Montana has really been a great help. So with that, we present this lovely award to you, the Cardinal Joseph Bergening Award for 2013. privilege to read the citation for the award for Zine Fox this evening. In his 1985 pastoral letter on ministry, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine shared these thoughts with his readers. Unfortunately, the emphases in our culture on competition and status influence our thinking, attitudes, and mode of operating in regard to ministry. We need to be mindful of what Jesus said. You know how it is among the Gentiles. 
those who seem to exercise authority lord it over them. Their great ones make their importance felt. It cannot be like that with you. Anyone among you who aspires to greatness must serve the rest. Whoever wants to rank first among you must serve the needs of all. In light of this, we must listen to one another very carefully in order to discover the same spirit of the one Lord at work in all of us. This has been a continuous task of the church from the time of Jesus until our own day, in which we seek to affect and respond to a renewal of ministerial life. Dr. Zini Fox has been the embodiment of this message in her years of teaching and ministry. She is described by colleagues in the School of Theology at Seton Hall University as one with a generous heart and a gentle nature, one who is able to inspire her students with her theological expertise as well as her collaborative style. She is particularly appreciated by ministers in the church for her longstanding and ardent commitment to the development of lay ministry, particularly ecclesial lay ministry. <clears throat> Professor Fox served with distinction as an advisor for over 15 years for the USCCB Committee on the Laity, as well as the Subcommittee on Lay Ministry that produced the important document on lay ecclesial ministry co-workers in the vineyard of the Lord. This work culminated in the publication of her latest book, Called and Chosen Toward a Spirituality for Lay Leaders. She has participated in many consultations with diverse church representatives, including canonists, diocesan leaders, leaders of lay organizations and theologians from this country and beyond. She has recently been involved with leaders of Catholic health care and Catholic education throughout this country as well as Australia. Like Cardinal Bernadine, she has a gentle and inviting way of offering her insights and observation, which are always grounded in her experience as theologian, teacher of seminarians and prospective lay ecclesial ministers, and parish minister. With deep appreciation for her extraordinary contribution to building common ground among her colleagues, students, fellow parishioners, and friends, the Catholic Common Ground Initiative is proud to present Zini Fox with the Cardinal Joseph Bernadine Award for 2013, June 7, 2013. I was overwhelmed when Sheila first contacted me in January, and I'm more overwhelmed at the moment. But as I thought about this award, I realized that it really honors the contributions that lay people are making to our church today. Lay ecclesial ministers and so many other lay people who have active roles in leadership and service in our communities. And I think that's a significant reality. And as I pondered it, I remembered the very document that you were referring to. I use that when I teach. Well, no longer because it's a little dated. But I had used Cardinal Bernadine's document in order to encourage lay students and in order to help seminarians understand the emerging role of lay ministers. I also, of course, use material that uh, Father Murnian, Phil Murnian, produced. And so it seemed that honoring lay ministry in the names of these two great churchmen was very significant. I think that in honoring lay ministers, we also recognize the great importance of so many others in the church, the visionary pastors who called them forth, the theologians, canonists, liturgists, who have pondered what is the meaning of this new reality in our church and have striving to incorporate more fully the roles that these lay people fill. Also the parishioners who accept their leadership, the bishops who have provided leadership in this way. Um, and as I pondered this, I thought also the spouses and the children who make sacrifices as their uh, family member 
gives long hours to church work, and not always at a level of monetary remuneration that they might have in another setting. Um, there was one thought that I had about the common ground and the work of incorporating lay ministry into our church. And it came from first something Phil said to me. He said that the work with the common ground was the hardest work he had ever done. And you know, he did so many diverse things, but he said this was the hardest work he had ever done. And some years after his death, Sister Catherine Patton, who took on leadership of the common ground, said to me, not knowing Phil had said this before, you know, it's the hardest work I've ever done. And I think it's an incredibly important work. I've applauded it from the time that I first heard of it. I send my small donation. <laughs> I've attended events that I've been able to attend because I believe deeply that the church needs what this group is doing, that the church needs to learn better to work with common ground. And part of that will be better incorporating lay ecclesial ministry into what Bishop Delaney referred to as the ministerium of the church. So with all my heart, I thank you. Good evening, I'm Father Michael Place, a member of the Board of uh, Common Ground Initiative. I had the privilege of uh, serving with Cardinal Bernadine for a while in Cincinnati and then for 14 years as his theologian in Chicago. And so I've been with the initiative from its beginning. It uh, struck me, and I don't know why it came to mind other than most likely because of the very sad news about Bishop Joe Sullivan, that it was uh, almost exactly this day in uh, 1995 that the Cardinal received the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Um, and with that, uh, obviously the course of his life changed. But even as he was battling to live, he was helping a new moment blossom in the life of the church because it was in that time period that the Common Ground Initiative uh, came forward. And actually his last uh, public remarks were at the first public convening of the board. <clears throat> and I have a picture from that convening, uh, which is of the Cardinal and Monsignor Mernian shaking hands. And if you look at that picture, the tendency would be to look at one or the other, because they both were remarkable gifts to the church, each in their own way. They each had a luminosity to them, a warmth, a, a generosity, and they were men who left a big footprint, each of them. The wonder was that unlike many other great people who fill big space, they were able to bring their spaces together so that something even more could happen. And that happened with the Common Ground Initiative. The Cardinal wrote a letter on parish life and was part of the process to ask Phil to comment on it and then they got into this conversation and that conversation and then we had years of uh, off the record conversations and then the Common Ground Initiative was born. It was born because two great men had one passion, the well-being of the Church of Jesus Christ. And so as the board was thinking about our being in New York, uh, it was Sister Sharon Ewart who remarked, you know that year is gonna be, would have been Phil's 50th anniversary of ordination. And so in putting this part of the program together, we thought, you know, 
it would be appropriate that in some way that handshake happened again tonight. And so, uh, Kathy Murnian, Monsignor's sister-in-law, is going to share some reflections on Phil. And then, and I'm not going to read the curriculum vitae of everybody, it's in, it's in the program. Kathy did serve on the board of directors of the National Pastor Life Institute, which was Phil's passion, an incredible gift to the church, and an incredible generosity that then took on common ground, unexpectedly born out of time, as it were. And so then we were in this, okay, we're going to spend some time once again capturing Phil's gift. What about the lecture? And what the Cardinal and Phil had in common, that passion for the church and the realization that where church really happens is in the parish. And uh, so we thought it would be appropriate to ask one of the best thinkers in the country who has done more research on the formation of seminarians and by direction into the life of parish, uh, Sister Katerina uh, Schutz, to reflect on how the ongoing influence of Vatican II and the Common Ground Initiative impact parish life. And as part of that, to look at the work Phil did over the years in shaping and gifting parish life in this country. If we look at the 20 years of the pastor life, Phil's work from starting with the research for the conference forward, uh, there is no person, no person who did more to foster the future and development of parish life in this country than Phil did. And so to respond to Katerina, uh, we've asked uh, almost Dr. Kevin Ahern, defending on June 18th, uh, who is a new member of the board. Part of the commitment of the Common Ground Initiative has been to realize that those of us who were around when this started might have been younger then, but we're not younger now, and that part of the future of the church, the future of the church is the next generations coming up and so we're trying to engender that in the life of the board and the Common Ground Initiative. So Kevin will be giving a response then to Sister's presentation. So we're just going to let it go seamlessly. We'll start with, uh, with Kathy and then uh, Katerina and then Kevin. And then we'll have an opportunity for question and answers. Yeah. Good evening. I'm pleased to speak with you briefly. I'm afraid Michael to touch this now. <laughs> um, about my brother-in-law, Philip. Uh, on behalf of his sister, Rosemary Murnian Gerties, who's here this evening. Rosemary, why don't you stand up and say hello to everybody. And her son and daughter, uh, Mary and William, who have joined us this evening also. Uh, and also on behalf of his brother, Dr. William Murnian, uh, whose health prevents him from being with us this evening. For those who knew Philip, um, we knew his fierce intelligence, uh, his strong sense of the aesthetic, and his personal magnetism. We also knew he could keep all of these in balance with a keen sense of humor about himself. He loved to tell the story, for instance, um, one of his daily visits to mom during her last days. The doctor had come in, and in testing mom's alertness, he pointed to Philip, who was standing at the foot of mom's bed, and, and said, um, do you know who that is? And without hesitation, mom said, 
that's my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> As Philip would tell the story over the years, he would add, and people wonder at the roots of clerical arrogance. <laughs> I just recently learned that a popular symbol for St. Philip is a loaf of bread. It goes back to the discourse between uh, Philip and Jesus at the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And what an apt symbol for our Philip also. For he was a man who loved a good meal. He's also a man who knew how to make a good meal. Actually an excellent meal. So here are just a few memories of Philip and food. As many of you know, Philip lived in the Bowery area from 1974 until his death in 2003. Uh, during that time, he witnessed the gentrification of the neighborhood firsthand. He told the story of heading off to the food markets on a Saturday morning, and on his way, he passed one of the Bowery old timers sitting on a curb. Hey, pal, how are you doing, Philip says. I don't know, Father. The old neighborhood ain't what it used to be. <laughs> that trip to the food markets might well have been one of the ones in preparation for our annual Easter dinners at the rectory on Elizabeth Street. Generally, we were somewhere between 13 and 20 in number. Mom Ernian, Philip's siblings, my husband John, Rosemary, and Bill, his niece, his nephews, and assorted in-laws and outlaws. We sat around the rectory table and devoured the five course meals that Philip put together from scratch. Absolutely fabulous. And accepted as gift the company, the meal, and all the love that he put into the preparation. Philip knew well the intrinsic value of coming around the table together for a meal. I once asked him why in heaven's name he was being so persistent in inviting two people to get together for dinner with him who obstinately bore personal grudges and imagined or real slights against each other. His reply was, if they sat down together and actually had to act civilly to each other, their hearts might well follow their actions. Conversion, dinner table as common ground. And a final image. Philip often joined my husband John and me for vacation time at our place in the country. A wonderful time, as you can imagine, of joy and talk and laughter and reading, <laughs> refreshment of body and soul. For each day as the sun set and the breeze cooled the air and chipmunks chased each other under the deck, we three would sit on the porch and break open the word and share the bread in celebration of Eucharist precious nourishment for our life's journey, and a binding force that sealed our love. Throughout his life, Philip was indeed nourished by the church he loved, and in turn, he sought to nourish it at its very roots, his focus on parish life. A life's work we'll hear more about from Sister Katerina, I'm sure. For now, I'll close with a very brief presentation in just a second that we put together after Philip, shortly after Philip's death with the help of Father Jim Gardner, who I understand started on a bus more than five hours ago from Washington and is still on the bus because of the weather. And before that, I leave you with the prayer that Philip chose for his ordination card from the letter to the Philippians. And for those of us who knew him, if you just close your eyes, you can hear not maybe Paul's voice, but Philip's voice 
saying to each of us, I give thanks to my God for all my memories of you, happy at all times in all the prayers I offer for all of you. And this is my prayer for you. May your love grow richer and richer yet in the fullness of its knowledge and the depth of its perception, so that you may learn to prize what is of value. May nothing cloud your progress. May you reap through Jesus Christ the full harvest. To, uh, to God's honor and praise. Amen. Amen. was, as many would say about him, the quintessential New Yorker. Born in the Bronx and raised in St. John's Parish, Kingsbridge, he was the youngest of four. His sister Rosemary remembers, Philip was three when our dad died. The four of us became latchkey kids before the term was invented, but that didn't hurt Philip. He was our baby brother. Philip Murray was a doer, an untiring, immensely creative worker. He exercised leadership in many projects. Cardinal Francis Spellman ordained him a New York priest on June 1, 1963 at St. Patrick's Cathedral. His first pastoral assignment was to St. Thomas the Apostle, a Harlem parish whose doors were recently shuttered. One of the first things he did was organize a parish bus trip to Martin Luther King's rally in Washington, D.C., where Dr. King delivered his unforgettable I Have a Dream speech. He made it real clear that he valued the legacy of Dr. King and Malcolm X. It was a testimony that there is plenty good room for all in the church. One of the things that caught his attention was the academic performance of the parish's kids. The next summer, he created Stress, St. Thomas's remedial education summer school for 120 kids who had performed one and a half years below grade level. The teeming streets of Harlem were followed by the comparatively bucolic streets of Staten Island, where he served at St. Patrick's Parish and taught at Monsignor Farrell High School. When he began his doctoral studies, he moved to St. Gregory's Parish and quickly became an Upper West Sider. In 1971, he received his Ph.D. in Sociology from Columbia University. That same year, he was appointed founding director of the Office of Pastoral Research of the Archdiocese of New York. He served as adjunct professor at Notre Dame, Fordham, and Boston College. He directed the parish project of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops from 1978 to 1982 and the Notre Dame Study of Catholic Parish Life from 1981 to 1983. Monsignor Jack Egan of Chicago was an influential mentor to Philip. Jack founded the Catholic Committee on Urban Ministry. Seekin became a national resource for social ministry and a forum for those involved in urban ministry. It surprised no one that Phil would follow Jack in heading Seekin. 
1983, he founded the National Pastoral Life Center with Ed O'Brien and Harry Fagan. He served as its director, as editor-in-chief of Church Magazine, senior consultant to the Roundtable, the Association of Diocesan Social Action Directors, consultant to the USCCB Committee on Lay Ecclesial Ministry, and director of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative, founded in 1996 by his friend, the late Cardinal Joseph Bernadine of Chicago. He also conducted two groundbreaking studies for the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. New Parish Ministers, published in 1992, spotlighting the utilization of laypersons in parishes, and Parishes and Parish Ministers, a follow-up study published in 1997. He was a good priest who ministered without an agenda other than the truth and always with friendship and compassion. Blessed with multiple personal talents, his greatest gift was the manner in which he enhanced the resources, the role, the vision, and the leadership of others. Our diocese is in the far corner of the western frontier, yet we were made to feel by Phil that we were just as important as any other place, including those dioceses and archdioceses larger and better known than ours. Phil was a priest. He was there with priestly interest, even when the problem might be national or international. I think of him as being absolutely unique, and must add that we will miss him very much. <coughs> Philip Murnion's journey ended late Tuesday afternoon, August 19th, 2003, but not his mission. That and his ideas will keep going on in the years ahead. The words he wrote, the hearts and minds he touched, and the challenge he issued as his legacy. In a letter he addressed to the American bishops, whom he had served in so many capacities, Philip Murnion wrote, if I were to sum up my final plea to you, dialogue, Dialogue, dialogue. Beautiful memories. Thank you so much, Kathy. I don't know where you want to sit, but um, uh, there you are. Uh, such a wonderful way to introduce what I uh, hope will add to the legend of uh, Father Philip Murnian. As we have well noted, the anniversaries of several momentous events have been instrumental in bringing us together tonight. And I thank you so much for leaving your cozy homes they're nice place, dry places and coming out to be here this evening to honor Phil and to remember the greatness that he has brought to this church. So we celebrate the joyful remembrance of his 50th anniversary of ordination and with lingering heartache, the 10th anniversary of his death this year. All he would have loved to commemorate the anniversaries of his ordination and Vatican II and I think he would have been utterly delighted to be here tonight, just to see all of you and to hear the nice praise that was given to him. Uh, his uh, mother's comment was a wonderful one, and his response was even better. The life-changing event uh, of Vatican II captivated Father Meridian's energy and enthusiasm in ways that led him to the forefront for many advances and improvements in church ministry. High on the list of attention that he gave to various issues was parish life, and it is that topic that I will focus on tonight. During his many years of ministry, he contributed extensively and meaningfully to the shape of parishes as we know them today. 
In honor of that great devotion, my presentation will focus on the topic of parish life, what it was like in the past around the time when Father Murnian was ordained, how he helped it to evolve very significantly, and its present condition, and perhaps I'll even venture a few thoughts on future prospects and possibilities. When Father Murray was ordained on June 1st, 1963, the church was in initial stages of momentous change. The first session of Vatican II signaled a fresh vision that we're being reminded of at, on this 50th anniversary. It must have thrilled this newly ordained priest. The early documents and general atmosphere emanating from Rome remind me a little bit of today with our new Pope Francis. In those days, it heralded transformation of so many aspects of church life that would engage Phil for the next 40 years. Now I'm going to give a few numbers, and sometimes numbers actually paint a picture. I know a lot of people don't like numbers, but I think they will be worthwhile ones as we set the context for what I will be saying. Um, you have a yellow sheet with a lot of numbers on them. That's a reference point for you to keep for your own uh, use later on. But let's look at 1963. The number of priests was 56,000 and some, just short of the peak year of 1967 when there were almost 60,000 priests. 40 years later, when at the time of Phil's death, there were 44,000 and now just 40,000, just short of 40,000. So we've seen a tremendous slide in the number of priests. Not only that, but sisters and brothers and others also changed in their numbers. I'll refer to them more specifically in a moment, but you can see that, especially in the case of sisters, we have 122,000 fewer today than at the time when Father Marini was ordained. That has changed the shape of parish life very significantly. <coughs> and for brothers, it's about 8,000 fewer. As astounding as these figures are, during that same period of time, look at the growth of the Catholic population from just short, uh, short of 44 million now to 68 million. An increase of 24 million. And just as startling, to accommodate these extra 24 million people, the number of parishes has barely changed. About 17,000 in 1993, 19,000 in 2003, and now down by another thousand at the present time to about 18,000. Thus, the average number of Catholics per parish rose about 1,200 for over the 50 years that we're discussing today. So that, those are some pretty dramatic figures. We could look at another uh, version of it, and we see diocesan priests where the numbers have changed not quite as drastically as they have for religious. On, the, on a, a smaller base, uh, the loss has been 11,000, and that loss continues at a great pace. The number of ordinations, which have been in the range of 800, 700 for many, many years, around the 1960s and, and onward, now in recent years has rarely been above uh, 500. And so we have this dramatic change in, in the church. Part of what was happening, even at the time of Phil's death 10 years ago, was a growth in the number of international priests. That too has changed the face of Catholicism in very dramatic ways. 17% of priests serving U.S. dioceses in 2004 were foreign born. It is estimated now that it's at least 25%, and about a third of seminarians are from other countries, which means in no time a third of the priests will also be from other countries. And so this has made it difficult for some parishes to adjust. I'm sure that Phil would have had so much to offer in order to help that uh, effort along to in incorporate priests from other countries. That kind of leadership is really needed today. And he was always on top of everything. I just look at these uh, data and I think, 
Phil would have had an answer for this. I mentioned already the number of sisters and that drop of 122,000. I never thought I would be 70 years old and being one of the younger sisters in the community, but in fact, that's the case. And that's probably the case in most uh, communities nowadays, with the exception of a few uh, of the newer communities. The number of brothers has also dropped off, affecting schools very much. And on a brighter note, moving in a different direction, how has the church survived in the midst of all this? It has done very well, thanks to something that Phil had foreseen and worked with for many, many years, and that was encouraging lay ministry. Zini referred to that so very well. And the uh, importance of his helping priests to become more open to having lay ministers serving, I think has made a tremendous difference and faster progress than we might ever have expected. And so in 1975, uh, the uh, number of, of uh, lay ministers was not counted very carefully, uh, estimated at 5,000. And even today, the official Catholic directory, that very fat book, has no data to speak of on lay ministry. Uh, a couple of studies have been done, the most recent uh, about uh, in 2010, where an actual count was done by David DeLambo, who's done a good deal of study, estimating about 28,000, and now there are about 40,000 lay ministers, lay ecclesial ministers. I, note, I noted the drop in the number of sisters. And what's interesting is that lay teachers have replaced sisters in schools at very, very great numbers. In 1963, there were only 62 or 3,000. Now there are 152,000 lay teachers. So thank God for the gift of lay people who have taken up service in the church in the ways that they have. And there are many other places in which this is done. Colleges and universities, for example, are among them. So that is a, a kind of a base that I would uh, like to now make some other comments about. Um, I'll turn over to where I will be later going. I'll leave that slide up for the moment. Um, let's go back to 1963. As I look across the audience, there are a few of you, maybe quite a few, who remember 1963 as well as I do. And then there are a few others that I see who were not even a glint in their parents' eyes at that point. Thank God for those young people who are, who are here too. At the time Father Murian was ordained, few would have imagined the transformation that was about to begin in parishes. What was the 1963 parish like? Perhaps most striking was the composition of the personnel, those who ministered in the parish. Typically, the pastor was over 50 years of age and well-seasoned, having served as an assistant for at least 25 years. Even much later than that, uh, in some dioceses, uh, a priest did not become a pastor until he was that age or older. If a young priest uh, was a good observer, he probably became pretty well prepared for the pastorate just by being in an apprenticeship for that many years. But it was the fortunate few who were really mentored by the pastor. Mentoring of, the old, of older men uh, for young, younger priests is something that Phil also really encouraged a great deal, but it was not common in those earlier years. The duties of the newly ordained most likely included teaching in elementary and secondary schools because there wasn't that much to do in the parish, and then waiting for some other tasks to be assigned. Um, as for the liturgy, mass was celebrated in Latin, of course. The priest faced the altar with his back to the congregation, and participation was limited to a few Latin responses that the young boy servers stumbled through. I remember our old pastor who was uh, the uh, pastor of my parish for 32 years, a different pattern as well. And uh, when new servers came on, we knew there would be a little bit of a circus at the altar because he would turn around and say, get those responses right. What did sister teach you? And very sternly correct the young boy why they continued to be servers and why so many of them became priests is still a bit of a mystery to me. 
Meanwhile, parish schools flourished in almost every parish of reasonable size, led by and staffed by sisters in rather elaborate habits. At all levels, they were teaching, often up to 20 or more in the local convent. 50 children were crowded all too many times in a classroom and of that era. The sisters' responsibilities usually included many other tasks around the parish. Teaching catechism, as it was called, CCD was not yet invented, and I don't think we even used the term religious education. It was catechism classes on Saturday for the children who were not attending Catholic schools. They cared for the sacristy and altar linens, trained servers, organized fundraisers for the schools, and on and on. There was no room for lay people with all that the sisters ended up doing. Having more than one or two lay teachers employed in the Catholic school was un unusual. Deacons, these were the young men awaiting ordination. It would be 10 years from 1963 before the first permanent deacon was ordained. And as, you know, as I noted, there were quite a number of them, 18,000 who have now been ordained. The decree on the apostolate of the laity was two years away from being issued in 1965. Significant involvement of the laity in parish ministry was still at least a decade, if not two decades, away at that particular point. So that was 1963. I'm sure that some of you would have even more elaborate memories of that time. I actually did teach in a Catholic school a few years after that. And it was very much as I described, in the Catholic elementary school, that is. It was in this context that the typical parish of 1963 that Father Meridian began his priesthood. Not surprisingly, after seeing that wonderful <coughs> video, Phil's pathway into ministry didn't quite follow the typical. As noted, he was on his way to the nation's capital to join in Mar Dr. Martin Luther King's March on Washington. And his, no doubt, his first assignment in the parish in Harlem uh, gave him firsthand experience with civil rights and anti-poverty movements. And later, when he taught in a high school, these experiences, I think, had a great deal to do with his later work at the National Pastoral Life Center and with the Catholic Common Ground Initiative and in many other settings and on different occasions. He knew what, a, what the poor were like, and he lived with them. And on, it, it appears, or it's very evident, that right from the start, he loved them. And this is a great gift to the church as well. I think our Pope Francis would have really enjoyed Phil a great deal, and vice versa. So unusual for that time, he was engaged in all kinds of ministry and well equipped with his doctorate in sociology from Columbia, also as noted. So for the next 40 years, he embarked on a path that changed forever the model of parish ministry in the United States. The volume of Phil's activities, writings, and published lectures is so vast that it's not easy to summarize his philosophy and vision. To refresh our memories of what he cared about, I read through the last 10 years of his editorials in Church Magazine, along with numerous articles. It was really a great treat. The breadth of this man's great mind is astounding. He covered every conceivable topic related to bringing about effective parish ministry, among other goals. I chose several four or five recurring themes that remind me of Phil's message and remind me of him, that wonderful smile on those pictures. And I hope some of these will sound familiar to you, too, and perhaps later you can add some of your own. The first thing I want to talk about is his theology, really. Um, I think I would call it a theology of the incarnation. It permeated his writings. It occurred over and over in those 10 years of editorials. That would have been 120, uh, 12 months. Or no, no, I'm sorry, it's four times a year times uh, the 10 years, so 40 times, but the articles sort of bring it up to 120. Uh, it was quite evident that Christ was his intimate and constant companion. At Christmas in 1999, he spoke of being preoccupied these days with the original mystery 
and continuing mystery of the Incarnation. The wonder of who Jesus was, the love that bore him, and the consequences for who we are. Uh, I have a few of these quotes now that I will uh, flash up on the screen for you to, to reflect upon as I, as I speak. Uh, he described the meaning of the Incarnation for him in visit, vivid language. Though he was not one to display his piety, he was a deeply spiritual person. The crucifixion is, of course, the ultimate expression of the Incarnation, he said, the self-emptying of Jesus. Self-emptying, a word that captures his spirit of generosity in serving everyone and everywhere if he could possibly respond. I remember at some of the common ground, uh, early common ground meetings, he was came exhausted from all kinds of talks he had just given, and yet he had the most life of anybody. And at night, he was ready to go way into the evening to discuss everything imaginable. He was self-emptying. He uh, wrote a poem at Christmas time in 1999 that was published in, in Church Magazine. He spoke of the Incarnation in this way, it, it comes in the fullness of time. Many expressed hope that in spite of the fact that this coming was and is now in the midst of uncertainty, he said it will never be the right time in his poem. It will never be much better. But yet there's consolation, no encouragement, because even though I am not the right one, nor are you, but all of us are all we have to discover together that the Lord is here before we miss the moment and it's too late. The Lord is here. It was all about relationship with Christ and relationship with each other that mattered. A year later, he uh, turned uh, again to this theme the Incarnation, he said, inaugurated a divine human dialogue that resonated from the depths of being, the being of God and our own being, and calls us into dialogue. So that word dialogue appears. As anyone who remembers Phil, promoting dialogue was vital to him. The ending of the video, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. He plunged himself into the Catholic Common Ground Initiative. Without his leadership, it would never have gotten off the ground nor thrived in the way that it has. He always thought in terms of both and rather than either or. He was a person who sought unity with the most disparate elements of the liberals and conservatives, bringing them together to engage in dialogue. This was his passion for Phil. He envisioned a time when the principles of common ground would be practiced at every level in the church. With Sister Catherine Patton and later with uh, Peter Den Denio, who was with us here, uh, they organized conferences, dialogues, with some of the most unlikely characters on some difficult topics, like authority in the church, varied understandings of the Eucharist and liturgical practice, sexuality and life issues from conception to death. These were just a few of the many really difficult topics that were taken up with Phil's leadership. Eventually, the depth of the struggle became even more apparent. It was uh, mentioned a couple of times, Kathy mentioned it, and I think um, also um, Michael, that um, the hardest thing that Phil ever did was working with the Catholic Common Ground Initiative. Having attended so many of those meetings, you could see why it was often extremely intense. He said, how curious and sad that dialogue has become a divisive word among us. What a waste of a gift. About the relationship between bishops and priests, he said, I find that the healthiest spirit, where fellowship in faith, hope, and charity is reflected in mutual challenge, support, and a sense of humor is where the priest with the bishop 
candidly discuss the issues facing the church. From beginning to end, Father Murnian urged what he referred to as partnerships. Through dialogue, cooperation and collaboration at all levels of the church with pope, bishops, priests, staff, and parishioners, this is what had meaning for him. Partnership meant to him mutual participation, and this practice, he said, was becoming a more common feature in church life. Thanks a lot to him, but he would not have ever said that. He was acutely aware of the work of lay ministers and commended their ministry as essential to parish settings. And in many gatherings of priests, he reinforced that notion. Behind the good relationships, he emphasized, was the necessity of shaping the day and shaping our lives through relationship with Christ. Again, that theme of his own deep spirituality. He never came across as being real pious, but reading all of his writings, he had to be deeply in love with his Christ, with Jesus. There were a few other things that he said over and over that I think have been so important and are and continue to be important to parishes today. It was about a way about how to understand a parish and how to make it function well. He talked about analysis and organization. And a couple of the ways in which he spoke of it, I think, are quite enlightening. He believed that the parish was extremely important. Um, this was a quote that he used in a 2002 in a 1980, from a 1981 statement of the bishops. The parish is, for most Catholics, the single most important part of the church. In numerous articles throughout his life, he reiterated the value of the parish and discussed ways to define, analyze, and organize for the greatest impact. His editorial, published after his death, said this, besides defining and expressing the identity of the individual as sacred, relational, and responsible, parishes define the world in ways that will affect one's involvement with the world. I thought the way Kathy described the family was a good indication of where those initial ideas about that relational dimension, uh, where that really came from. He was always conscious of the wide variety of parish structures and practices with their prevailing ecclesiologies. He described those with centralized authority and devotional piety on one side, and egalitarian style with a social dimension and broad participation on the other. Yet he was attentive to the needs of all and looked for that which united rather than that which divided. At the center of the continuum, lies the parish that is, by definition, pastoral, he said, by which he meant that a parish must make an effort to be accountable to official teaching, very faithful to the church. He quoted church documents, used them very effectively, accountable to official church teaching and norms, but accommodating to local cultures and individual needs, attentive to the demands of personal piety and morality, as well as to social morality and spirituality, so the both and, authentic in its teaching and worship, and very pragmatic in its programming. Father Murnian concluded, the parish is a mystery of faith. He pointed out that individual situations were affected by local area, race, and nationality of the people, their age, sex, and education, their attitudes and experiences. And it was on the basis of some of these topics that he urged the pastors, the priests, and those others who worked in the parish to analyze the parish as they were attempting their ministry. Based on, on the reality of this great uh, variety, uh, the analysis I found he often focused on the Eucharist with the heart, as the heart of it. Using the image of the body of Christ for the church, he maintained that church design and worship practice should make clear the relationship between word and sacrament, the congregation and the presider, the spiritual and physical and material reality and action. Thus he concluded, our gathering in the Eucharist and our going out to the poor are intrinsic to each other. Our gathering in the Eucharist and our going out to the poor are intrinsic to each other. 
his life in the Bowery for almost 30 years, how that affected what he said and thought and how he lived. Pastoring, he insisted, requires constantly reaching out to those who are not part of the community, and especially those who are most marginal, most distressed, most in need. It means enabling parishioners to be missionaries in their families, work, and communities, bringing the life, meaning, and message of Jesus and his gospel to all they do. To achieve this, uh, he stressed that certain organizational requirements had to be met. Oh, okay, that comes in a little right now. Uh, he talked a lot about the organization of parishes, and he said this was necessary to be well organized if they were to function well. Uh, in many educational settings, he helped structure components of effective administrative practice. One particular story or piece of advice that he imparted comes to mind, and this is quoted up here. He said in uh, 2001, once I was accused of having an agenda. My worry, uh, my reaction was to say, no, of course I have an agenda. Don't you worry about those who either profess they don't or actually don't have an agenda. You know, it's kind of a slam, you have an agenda. But he said, doesn't having an agenda mean having a mission that is more than wishful thinking? So planning, organizing. This was what he urged on the, the priests and the, the ministers in the church. So these few themes are just uh, a few of the many that Phil attended to throughout, throughout his life. But he already recognized them in one of his earliest publications and I have a, a copy of it here, 1977. It was published by the then United States Catholic Conference, now USCCB, uh, forming the parish community. This is, if, is as if it could have been written a week ago. As I was examining the data on the state of parishes today and the trends that are emerging, I was struck by the correspondence between the areas that Phil raised at that time and the concerns of today. For example, he noted that the young and well-educated are much more likely to become disaffected from the faith and church than their predecessors, 35 years ahead of the Pew study that came out this year. He talked about the movement from territorial parish mem membership to voluntary commitment and its potential implications and haven't there been great implications of that shift. With the territorial parish gone, people go where they please, and so ministry is going to be directed to, to a certain group of people. If you don't do your ministry well, if the sacraments and the Eucharist are not presented well, people will simply go elsewhere. So he discussed the varieties of parish models and the ways parish ministry was extending itself beyond the confines of parish structures and into the larger community. He had that notion too, that the parish doesn't stop within the walls of the, of the church. And interestingly, he even used inclusive language. That was hardly ever done in 1977. And there's one place where it said something about uh, guidance for men, dot, 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 and women. And in other places too, I was sort of entertained by that. So these few recollections of Phil's thinking and acting <clears throat> bring us to, to the point of the directions of parishes have taken through the years. Recall for a moment the typical 1963 parish. What of the parishes today? How would we describe them as they are today? Perhaps most notably, personnel has changed but also the sizes of parishes, ethnic and racial composition of par parishioners, and attitudes of Catholics have changed a great deal. I need to go back now. Uh, originally I had a slightly different uh, order of things, but I think this was, uh, okay, this is where I want to be. So, um, on the topic of the pastors first, they range in age, now, pastors, that is, quite literally from 26 to 86. More typically, 30 through 70 is more usual, 
And priests can no longer look forward to retiring at the age of 65, which they used to all the time. Um, in 1970, this is shortly after Phil was ordained, the average age of diocesan priests was, would you imagine, 34 years old. It is now 64. And half of those who are diocesan priests now will be retired in the next 10 years or so. So big, big changes. The ages of priests, I remember uh, when I was doing research on a book I'll be mentioned shortly on multiple parishes, priests serving multiple parishes, um, the oldest person that I encountered was 83 years old. And he was serving three parishes, driving at least 1,000 miles a month uh, in order to get to his parishes, and very enthusiastic. Um, he, uh, you know, I said, well, you know, we're concerned about there aren't very many young priests coming up. In fact, about half the number of who are ordained each year, about 500, is half of what we need to keep pace with the needs of the church. And he said, well, that's okay. I can serve at least another 15 years. <laughs> so despite his enthusiasm, it, uh, it makes it very difficult. Um, back to the uh, parishes of, of today. Assistant pastors are almost a thing of the past, except for the largest parishes in the most priest-rich dioceses, and there are those, only rarely are associates assigned after their first couple years of ordination. They spend less time in apprenticeships, and so they know less when they enter into parish ministry. Again, a pastor of being a pastor, Again, the importance of lay ministers who've been in the parish and can help them along to understand how to minister well. No more easing into the priesthood. It comes very, very rapidly. Just to show how, uh, again, the, the numbers, two-thirds of the dioceses in this country have fewer active priests than they have parishes. So two-thirds have a good number of priests who serve more than one parish. Overall, parishes average nearly 4,000 members, which as we looked at earlier, it's 1,200 more than it used to be 50 years ago. So a second big change, well, I guess it was right there, the sizes of parishes. Um, the largest group, the group of the, those who are large, and I think 3,000 is kind of a small number to be mega, but they are in fact much larger. They've increased by almost 10%, or if you go down to the bottom, the family parishes, the small ones, have decreased by almost the same. So many of those have um, uh, been uh, clustered with other parishes. And seven dioceses have lost 50 or more, more parishes in the last 10 years. And many of them have been those small ones. So you see that the priests now, even at a very young age, are either serving very large parishes or they are serving more than one parish. The, smaller, the uh, smaller parishes are clustered at a very, very great rate. Um, this, uh, these figures come from a book that I wrote in 2006, Priestly Ministry in Multiple Parishes, published by Liturgical Press. And at, in the, uh, what I discovered in looking at what every single priest in the United States is doing, at that time over 40,000, um, the priests the parishes served by a priest with uh, multiple parishes was at that time, 2005 was the research that was published in 2006, 44%. Now it is well over 50 and I think heading close to 60% of parishes are in a cluster of some sort or another, merged in some way. The number of priests or the proportion of priests serving like that has also increased from at that point around 20% to at least 30, and I think it's getting closer to 40% uh, as a matter of fact. So that's a big change, and I've changed rapidly since Phil's death 10 years ago. Other personnel is vastly different too. The nearly 18,000 permanent deacons number almost enough for one per parish, so they are not distributed that way. The 40,000 paid lay ministers and countless volunteers assist in untold ways in helping parishes thrive, even as the number of priests and religious continues to slide in a rather rapid downhill spiral. The nearly ubiquitous Catholic 
parish schools are closing in many parishes, uh, even though there are still so many lay people working in them. Parishes scramble to keep adequate enrollment, no more classes of 50 in a, uh, of students in a class. Raising funds to pay for them to keep these schools open is a vexing problem as well. Though thousands of sisters still work in parishes, many of them are quite old, and parish school, they may work in parish schools, but mostly as volunteers, and their numbers too are diminishing rapidly. Besides personnel, even more remarkable have been the changes in worship. How has parish liturgy changed since Vatican II? Uh, in this brand new issue of America, May 27th, uh, Father John Baldwin uh, writes an article called An Active Presence. And he talks about the results of the council. And he says that in terms of worship, the results have been fairly mixed. But he does note four significant areas of change. The use of the vernacular, the reorientation of the church building, priests no longer facing the stationary altar, the expansion of ministerial participation, and the structuring of the liturgical year. Let me just say a few words about each of those. The mis mixed results referenced by Father Baldwin are often labeled as the reform of the reform. I think in some ways I've painted a somewhat positive, but not entirely, picture of the parish today. And I was admonished by some of my uh, friends in, today, not to be too positive, and others said, others said, don't be too negative, especially Bishop Michael. So I'm trying to hit a balance here. But about um, the reform of the reform, for example, um, Father Baldwin says, in English, we seem to have moved from a rather loose and somewhat uninspiring translation to a text that is stilted and filled with ar awkward archaisms. I think that the reversion that was experienced would have driven Phil, ever eloquent himself, maybe a little crazy. I can imagine him trying to get through some of those colics. Relative to the church building, the reform mandated that the main altar of any church at which the Eucharist was celebrated needed to be freestanding so that the presiding priest could stand on the side facing the people. As a result, liturgy became more communal and participative. We have seen, however, that in some parishes, the altar of that nature is wheeled out when the bishop comes and wheeled back with the uh, priest facing it at the wall again uh, in, on occasion. Uh, hopefully, again, Pope Francis will help all of this. The third area of reform is noteworthy, uh, the, the noteworthy expansion of liturgical ministers, deacons, readers, acolytes, servers, musicians, and extraordinary ministers of communi communion how this has enlivened and brought so many people into active participation. Finally, the rearrangement of the liturgical year. I had forgotten about a lot of these things, and maybe it will remind you of some too. Father Baldwin talks about Sunday being restored to its pride of place, celebrating the Paschal mystery, the path of passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord, the integrity of the 50 days of Easter, fewer ranking saints days. Uh, when I entered the convent in 1960, we uh, had high masses all the time. The good thing about high masses and about all those big saints was that we got to talk on those days at meals. And so we were happy to celebrate every saint you can imagine. It would be pretty bleak nowadays if in fact anybody didn't talk at meals. Uh, Lent uh, had a twofold focus, it now has a twofold focus. That of Christian initiation, the RCIA, what a tremendous gift that has been to the church, and renewal of that invitation through penance for the, those who are uh, already initiated. Also, much richer lectionary, the three-year cycle, more Old Testament readings and daily readings that change um, by the year as well. So I'm sure you can think of other things, but the church, the um, Vatican II has made a tremendous difference and Phil rejoiced in those, I think all of us did, and we draw back a bit with the reform of the reform, at least some of us do. In each area, some of the major goals are now being challenged, so the main task of understanding more deeply 
and more explicitly, the connection between life and church celebrations remain. That was something that Phil tried so hard to get across to, to the press, that there must be a connection between life and church celebrations. One can't be so terribly separated from the other. As we look to the future, we have the far-sighted insights, experience, and research of the past promoted and forwarded by Father Meridian for 40 years. And just a short ending now, we are also fortunate at this time to have a relatively new study, 2008, of pastoral ministry and parishes led by Marty Jewell and David DeLambeau, both lay people, and also cooperating with six national Catholic groups. It's called the Emerging Models of Pastoral Leadership Project. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. In looking to the future, the study concluded that changes in pastoral leadership will be needed in order to deal with several key issues. Parish clustering, the changing nature of the faith communities, lay leadership, multicultural diversity, and young adult participation in leadership. The study emphasized the need to work together, to partner in Phil's words, to find the courage to create vibrant parishes. And the hallmark of these vibrant, excellent parishes, thriving, they are thriving because well, they are following the prescriptions for success recommended and recognized by Father Meridian more often than you can imagine. And they're being followed through with a multitude of priests and lay leaders who were lucky enough to attend his seminars through the years. Four points uh, quickly of the characteristics. They have developed, these thriving parishes have developed mission statements with broad consultation and they engage in pastoral planning. They have an agenda. They have, uh, number two, engaged in planning after analyzing the needs of the parishioners with extensive involvement of groups and individuals. Third, they have organized the many activities of the parish led by the pastor and staff, by competent lay ministers, informed pastoral councils and knowledgeable finance councils. Training for all is required to keep up their skills. They communicate, interact, relate, dialogue across many parish entities with representatives partnering with each other in parishes and reaching out to the broader local community and the universal church. These characteristics can be summarized in three words, intentionality as in the mission statement, complexity in terms of having to analyze and organize, and vitality in that they have to communicate with each other. These are some of the suggestions of the emerging models. It is, must be attended by good preaching uh, with scripture that connects to daily life. Uh, a pastor who is energized and enthusiastic about ministry and leads his staff in, the, in a joyful uh, combination of partnership. Liturgies that are prayerful, reverent, and spiritually moving, and then engaging in outreach to the poor. These are the things that the Emerging Models talks about. All of these notions, Phil was already advancing for many years. So many more, many more stories and legends about Phil could be retold as we long for his presence here with us this night. Perhaps some of you will be ready after we hear from Kevin uh, and well, ready and willing to share some of your memories and add your experience of parish life. So we now look forward to hearing from Kevin. Thank you so much, uh, Sister, and uh, I, I'm one of those people that really loves numbers, so this type of presentation gets me very excited, but that's why I guess I'm doing doctoral studies in theology and uh, theological ethics. Uh, I, the, the idea of the Common Ground Initiative and the legacy that we're celebrating this evening of Monsignor Murnian and the Second Vatican Council are things that deeply shape who I am as a theologian, and what I hope who I am as a baptized practicing Catholic. So it's my honor here to, uh, to, to respond to, or to try to offer a little bit of a response to uh, Sister Katerina's pre wonderful presentation. Uh, and by way of, uh, since I've been educated by the Jesuits for too many years, uh, but I will take the model of a good Jesuit homily and uh, outline three points that I think really come uh, from her presentation. I then will put forward to us two challenges that I think we have uh, going ahead. First, 
one theme that, uh, sister, that sister, uh, highlighted is the Eucharist. As Catholics, I think it's not a surprise for us to see the centrality of the Eucharist in Monsignor Murnian's thought and as well as in the lives of parishes today. Vatican II, which we're celebrating uh, the anniversary uh, this year, as we know, beautifully stated that the Eucharist is the source and summit of all Christian life. Right? It's a powerful thing to say, source and summit of all Christian life. For me, what is so powerful is that the Eucharist is so deeply interrelated to everything that we do as Christians. So not just about what happens on Sunday morning, but what also happens on Monday at work, what happens on Friday evening, you know, when you're out with, with friends or, or your loved ones, what happens uh, in the voting booth? How do we relate the Eucharist to every part of our aspect? I think that's one legacy uh, of the council, and that's one, one thing that I think we can see uh, highlighted in, in Monsignor Murian's uh, leg uh, legacy. The second theme that comes out is the incarnation. I was really struck and happy to see uh, this mentioned. Uh, I've been reading recently uh, a new book by, uh, by Lisa Cahill, who's on the, uh, the Common Ground uh, Board as well, on Christology and Christian ethics. And Lisa makes a very important message, uh, makes a very important point to say that how we understand Christ, so what we profess in the creed every Sunday about the incarnation, deeply shapes how we relate to the world, deeply shapes how we relate to one another, deeply shapes the whole thing about dialogue. To believe that God so loved the world that God became man, this idea that the world is not something dirty, I think prevents us from getting into a sectarian withdrawal. It's so tempting, I think, in our world to, to take go the Amish route. I love the Amish. But Catholics have a different way of approaching, approaching the world, right? We, we, don't, we don't go sectarian, it generally. We're the church approach. So the incarnation, I think, helps inform us about the need for us to engage others and to not withdraw into our own little sub, subfields of, uh, even within the church. We see this throughout the church. The third, uh, third theme that I think is very important to mention and, and really relevant for our church today is the idea of partnership. So it wasn't one of the themes you, you put up there, but, I, but you highlighted it a, a few times. This, this is so, I think, really important. Uh, one other way to put this is co-responsibility. Uh, following Vatican II, Cardinal Suens, uh, he, uh, one of the council fathers, one of the more important council fathers in advocating for the place of the laity in the church, he said that co-responsibility was one of the major defining characteristics of the post-Vatican II era. So, you know, in Vatican II, as we know, talked about the universal call to holiness. So I almost wonder if we can talk about the universal call to participation or the universal call to partnership or the universal call to a co-responsibility. So all of us as baptized Christians have a responsibility in the church. Professional lay ecclesial ministers or professional theologians like myself or, or people who work in, in pastoral ministries like my wife, they are part of that, part of that, but they're not the only ones. So one of our challenges, how do we get the baptized Christians who are not professionally employed by church ministries or, or by the church to feel that sense of ownership, that sense of participation, that sense of partnership? I think that was a really important legacy of, uh, of, of what, what we've been talking about this evening. So two challenges going forward. And I'll have some personal experience with, with both of them. The first is the global reality of the local church. So this is, I think, a blessing and a challenge for us. As a blessing, we see, as, as Sister said, there are many priests from different parts of the world in our local communities bringing richness of experiences, vitality, new ideas, challenging, challenging racism and parochialism and, and other aspects uh, that, that, are, that are still prevalent in many parts of our, uh, in many parts of our lives. But, but, one, but one thing that's also challenging is how do we manage that? I was at a, a parish appeal a few years ago and after I went and spoke at the Spanish-speaking mass early in the morning, and then in the English-speaking uh, mass later on, one of the one of the parishioners, uh, ushers, came up to me and said, "You know, we're not like them. 
meaning them at the earlier mass, in the sacristy. I, I didn't know how to respond, so I just smiled and nodded, but I, I always feel guilty not really challenging him right then and there. It really caught me off guard. So how do we find strategies, agendas, to help parishes in these transitions of multiculturalism? Right? So globalization and, and our dynamic of our new world has, has this element of more and more in, in different cultures and multiculturalism. The local churches are becoming global churches. Uh, it's beautiful, but it's a challenge, so we all have to work on that. A second challenge that Sister also mentioned is that of the deterritorialization of the parish. So for, for me, in my own personal life, my wife and I, we don't feel we live outside of, outside of Boston and Newton. We don't go to our local geographic parish. We drive 10, 15 minutes to downtown Boston every Sunday and go to a very dynamic parish that is that a lot of our, our friends, uh, young adults, go to. And you know we're willing to, the homilies often last 45 minutes, and we're willing to sit through it because it's just such a wonderful, such a wonderful place. I feel conflicted about that, though. Because positively, we leave feeling very enriched. There's also good uh, uh, bagels and donuts and things afterwards. Um, so we leave full in, in many senses. But negatively, does this lead to increasing polarizations in the church? Does this mean that all the young adults who think in a certain way go to one parish? Whereas my aunt, who also lives in Newton, she drives the other direction to go to the Latin-speaking parish. <laughs> So what, what is the, how does that mean? How do we meet? How do we find ways to address people's needs and, and give them those spaces for enriching, but also uh, find ways to, uh, to, to bring people together? And this is a challenge. I wish I, wish I had the answer uh, for that. Um, and uh, the theologian Vince Miller in a Theological Studies article a few years ago on globalization and the church talk, warned of this, these life uh, enclaves of uh, ecclesial enclaves, ecclesial lifestyle enclaves. Uh, and, and I worry that sometimes our parishes start to look so similar that pe everyone who votes alike looks, has the same economic bracket or in one place and everyone else is another. Where is communion in that sense? So uh, it's a big challenge for us and we need more initiatives like Common Ground uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and others. Just to end on a note of hope, uh, last year, we, I, a few of us at Boston College, we organized a conference for young theologians called Emerging Theologians. So Sister Katerina talked about the, new, the rise of lay ecclesial ministers. This conference brought together 90 young theologians from 12 or so different countries. One of the most striking things about it was most of the people were lay people. It was about evenly split with women and men, more, a little bit more women than men. But most everyone were, were lay theologians. When, look, when we were looking back at the council, we realized there were no lay theologians at that time. What a, what a shift in, in, in moving going forward. One thing that was very clear and very hopeful for me is that it was clear for everyone there, and they chose to come there, that Vatican II still mattered. Many of them had struggles with the church, struggles with their local pastors, struggles with their own faith commitment, but they deeply, deeply love the church. So we do have challenges, we do have things that we have to over work, work to overcome, but there is a lot of things that we can find hope in. I think Pope Francis will help us to mine those as we go forward. Uh, so there's, there's a lot, of, lot ahead of us, a lot of uh, work to be done, but uh, I, I know the Holy Spirit is, is with us in our communities. Uh, so thank you, Sister Katerina, and thank you for everyone for your work on this. Thank you.